Uh, but uh, let's start with Lorraine to, to do the introduction. Okay, may, may we sit? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Riviera Bay Neighborhood Association, for this chance to speak with you tonight. I offer 20 years of experienced, networked, grassroots activism, activism that successfully realized legislation supported by the vast majority of the voting population, and activism that prevented bad legislation unsupported by the vast majority of the voting population. My platform spans issues as cutting edge as climate change and sea level rise, very relevant to this neighborhood, uh, to bread and butter issues such as public safety, healthy neighborhoods and business districts, transportation, clean water, and infrastructure redevelopment, also very pertinent to this neighborhood. A vote for me is a vote for your voice to be heard. I have come to the aid of this part of town before as a volunteer. Many may remember when I almost single-handedly stopped the building of the cell tower on Holy Family property. Then uh, Kona President Barbara Heck called me in to accomplish that task. I have friends and associates all over the city, this county, and the state, many in government currently, and many that I have helped with issues that touched them. I am ready and able to serve. So let's go. Please go to votelorainemargison.com to learn more about me and the issues. And please, like my Facebook page, Lorraine Marchison for St. Petersburg City Council. Uh, my current job, by the way, is I'm the office manager for the Stop the Lens office. Thanks for listening. If we could save all the applause till later, right at the Hello again, I'm Jim Kennedy, and I've had the privilege of being your city council person for almost six years and I appreciate being able to uh, continue that for another four. I, I would like to basically split this up in three parts. The first part as to things that I've done for the district. While in here, we've put in four playgrounds, um, dredged canals, sidewalks. The nine-acre park that's going to be adjacent to us is uh, a feat that not only took getting $1.6 million out of Wikiwachi, it took negotiating with the school board through three um, school board superintendents and uh, getting a 50-year lease with them. So I brought a lot back to the district. From the point of view of the leadership that I've provided with the city, I have been chair of city council. I have been chair of the budget finance and taxation committee for four years. I've been chair of the investment oversight committee for four years. I'm chair of the EMS committee. As our firefighters mentioned, that's a hot issue, and my colleagues put me in charge of that, and we talk about that issue, I'll be able to give you some more detail there. Um, so from a city point of view, I've provided a lot of leadership, not only uh, on the committees, but also um, in helping give advice uh, behind the scenes and working with the city staff to accomplish things. And then from a county point of view, I've been able to assume a leadership position in transportation, which is one of this county's biggest challenges. Uh, I currently serve as the chair of the Pinellas Planning Council, which is in charge of land use countywide. I am on the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is in charge of transportation countywide. I am a member of the ACPT, which is the advisory committee on Pinellas Transportation, which is running the 2014 uh, Greenlight Pinellas, um, and my time is up. But uh, thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to start the questions uh, with Jim. We'll start this since we started with Lorraine before. Uh, I've got two about canals. Some of our canal front residents around Teddy Creek have been assessed, charged money to dredge upstream silt from being deposited in their canals. Would you work to get the two sumps near 4th Street cleaned out on a semi-regular schedule, maybe more during rainy season, and then to go along with that, uh, I'm concerned with water quality in our canals. I have personally documented several instances where city projects or private development have a lot of construction runoff to pollute our canals. All the city county does is, all the city slash county does 
is slap the responsible party's hand. Meanwhile, we are still paying for the last degree of our canals at 8% interest. If elected, how will you help us keep the crap out of our canals <laughs> and, and improve our water quality, which directly translates to improved property values? So, well, first on the, the stumps, um, in working with Mike Connors, who's our engineer director, he has advised me that basically they come out and they can measure the, the depth of the sump, stump. And when it gets to the appropriate depth, they clean it out. So as I understand it, that is actually occurring at this point in time. From the point of view of the best way to increase the water quality, I believe really is on the San Martin Bridge when we get it back there. What we need to do is lengthen the bridge from the point of view of the amount of water that flows underneath it. Right now, there's, it's built up with land, and then there's places for the, the boats to go through. But uh, if we have a new bridge, what that needs to be is not only as high as it can be, but to allow the water flow to go in and out as, as far as it can go. Um, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to bring back the Tiger Grant to accomplish that. Thank you. So am I answering the same question? Yes. yes um, I am somewhat familiar with the canal issue. Um, number one, understand that uh, I live in a neighborhood that floods regularly, I heard you talking about, and water quality has nothing to do with bridges. Water quality has to do with pollution from runoff, pollution from motorboats, pollution from all other kinds of things. Yes, water flow has a slight, slight effect on that, but, you know, we live in a very built-out area, you know, dredged out canals and, and systems, and we are facing, um, and I will be bringing this up very often on the campaign trail, measured water sea level rise, okay? So there's a lot of infrastructural um, uh, attention that needs to be paid, particularly to areas like this, Shore Acres. I live right near Mangrove Bay Golf Course, and I've been there for 12 years, and I can measure about a six inch sea level rise since I've lived there, okay? Now, six inches doesn't seem like a lot, but six inches every 12 years starts to really build up, and maybe some folks won't you know, be here when it really gets to a critical level, but I know that there are a lot of kids and grandkids who care about it, so a bridge isn't going to solve your sole problem. Thanks. But you need the bridge anyway. It's dangerous. Now we'll start the next one with Lorraine. Uh, with the large and still growing amount of taxpayer money being spent in Midtown and Downtown, how would you ensure that all neighborhoods get their fair share of improvements and attention to their concerns? That is a wonderful question, and West End feels the same way that you do, by the way. Most of the city feels the same way, that downtown has gotten way too much of the financial attention. I totally agree. Um, Midtown is a focus because of several critical issues. But we are not looking and communicating with all of our communities because there are issues of either blight, shall we say, or canal issues, or, or road issues, or paving issues all over the city. And I feel that we have definitely, as a governmental body, been concentrating way too much on a certain area of our geographical responsibility. Something that I will do and have done and am in communication for 20 years as a volunteer will make sure that we have to speak to everyone and then look at the pot of gold and then make more, more equitable decisions. We are not doing that now. Downtown gets it all just about. I don't know whether the premise of the question is actually a, an accurate question. Um, there is a, when, when you talk about Midtown and you do have areas of greatest, greatest concern, sometimes you do have to give additional resources to those areas of greater concern. From the point of view of our district not getting its fair share, I don't necessarily think that's true. I mean, when Lynch Elementary School was um, rebuilt, after it was rebuilt, those streets that were beat up by the trucks going in and out, they got paved. Um, we have a paving scenario. I'm not aware of any substantially, you know, problems that we haven't addressed in this area. So I think we do get our resources. I think when we have problems, we um, are able to address them. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jim, although the roads are still drivable, some of our roads are in desperate need of repaving. 
They tell us it won't happen in 2013, and we're not on the books for 2014 either. Would you fight to get our roads re repaved in 2014? Well, and we've got to look at which roads we're talking about. If we're talking about 62nd Avenue, that's county. If we're talking, you know, you, you need to look at the roads. The roads that we have difficulty with our district, they are county roads. I, I am not aware, and no one has told me of any roads that they are having problems with that we haven't addressed. So, the county roads, I know we have a problem. 94th Avenue. Okay. There's one. What's the concern? It's, it constantly gets patched and patched and patched, but it's not repaid. But if you go up to uh, 99th Avenue, which that road doesn't serve anybody except that office complex, they paved it. It didn't need paving, but they brought in a milling machine and paved it. It's, it's very nice, but why? The, there, <laughs> there is a 15-year a cycle on, on, on paving roads. Um, I can check into 94th and see where it is and what the concern is, but I wasn't aware of that until a minute. So, Jim, 89th hasn't been paved, I know this for a fact, has not been paved in 23 years. Well, the... the, the uh, that's, that's, I don't mean that. I'm going to get out there. The, the, I'm sorry. The, 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 uh, uh, that's one thing that a lot of people do is, is they'll, they'll, they'll sit on it and stew about it rather than call the city and tell them that, that, that uh, I'm not saying you in particular, uh, I, I'm saying a lot of people will come to me about a problem with the city and I'll say, well, have you even told anybody in the city about it? And no. I mean, I know we had a problem with Wheaton Island over there and came out and fixed it. So, I mean, it's one of those things, if I don't know the problem exists, it's hard to fix. But so, 94th and... 89th. 89th. I'm going to call you wrong. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Lori? Yes, well, um, of course, I actually didn't know about 94th, but I really can't do any fourth thing for you yet until you vote for me and I sit on council. But when I do sit on council, I will be very available. Um, I will make it a point when I'm in council meetings, and hopefully you will come to some of them when you have a particular concern. And as opposed to most of the sitting city council members now, instead of ducking out the back, the side door off the dais, I will always walk through the crowd so that you can yell at me, talk to me, tell me, speak with me. You know, help me because really, my I have one vote as a citizen in St. Petersburg. What I don't see happening is enough folks being talked to by representation, and not just my opponent, but many others sitting on council right now, in order to discern and amalgamate the opinions, the majority opinion of the citizenry. That I will do. I can't fix your roads now, but actually, I am going to call uh, Raul Quintana tomorrow and start getting working on that for you. 89th, 94th, got it. I don't have to be a sitting council member to help you. Can I throw another road in there? Heck yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Riverside Drive, northeast, north of 83rd Avenue. The city came in and changed all our sewer things, tore the road up. <coughs> that road's a mess. Just tons Riverside of patchwork. Riverside Drive, northeast, 89. North 89. of 83rd. Tallahassee Drive Northeast, north of 83rd. You same know what? Same deal. Yeah. yeah. Do me a favor, Dave. Send a paper around. Let's get all the roads that okay. we're having a problem with, and I will get on it. You don't have to be a council member to start working on it. I know Raul very well, so I'll get on it. Will you do that, Dave? Get get a list of all these streets. Pass it around the tables and. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine. Yes, sir. Would you work to reinstate the neighborhood partnership grants? Oh, absolutely. That has been a horror story. Of course, as some of you know, I started my civic career uh, off the corridor, 34th Street Corridor. Um, I led the anti-drug dealer and hooker protest for years there. And the reason, I started the crime watch on 34th Street Corridor and eventually helped create the 34th Street Corridor Association, which has also gone to heck because I live up here now. Uh, I did stay for two years even when I moved because I knew uh, it was so important. But only because the neighborhood partnership grants could we get our crime watch off the ground because we had all of that opportunity, you know, flyers, places for meeting locations, and then staff help from the city. That is critical. It's as much spirit as you have as one citizen. It's hard to round up a neighborhood and get them participating and volunteering when you're a beginner unless you get help. 
absolutely, that is public safety, community policing, and that is not number one and two on my plate. Yes, I do support that, um, having the grants because basically it does help the neighborhood association put together. What happened was basically Mayor Foster had moved it into a scenario where he was having um, different private entities sponsor the grants. There was some trust doing it for a little while, there was another bank doing it for a little while, so it wound up being moved out of the budget and was being funded by uh, basically contributions from business entities that would then be directed back into the neighborhood associations. I like that concept where you have businesses within the city con contributing to the neighborhood associations because that to me makes a good uh, symbiotic relationship between the neighborhood associations and the businesses. Um, so I think that needs to be pushed and it was kind of let down. If the businesses aren't there to do that, the city needs to step in, but I would prefer to have independent private financing and it does make sense from a business point of view of why they would want to support neighborhoods uh, from the, the concept. So if we can't get businesses to do it, I would support having city money to do it. Sorry. <laughs> I got distracted. Sorry. <laughs> Volunteers aren't allowed to fire themselves. <laughs> Uh, Jim, what would you do about the ugly, rusting sewer drain covers that the city throws on our sewers whenever they need repairs? I have seen very nice stamp designs in concrete in Midtown. <laughs> you know, you know, from that point of view, I would have to deal with city staff and you tell me what sewer drain. I mean, uh, A, I, I probably don't understand the color you're talking about, but, uh, that's a, uh, I, to, I don't have a response from the point of view of you with the sewer drain. I mean, that's something that transportation all works on. Um, if there's a particular problem with one, once again, let me know. I, I, I've heard other complaints that, that, that they, they put on these, that they have like a metal band around them, and within uh, days they're rusting and they, they just look terrible. Uh, I think that's what they're talking about. You know, well, city council is one of those things where you're a uh, jack of all trades, and from the point of view of what gets in front of us, to to envision to for me to be going around inspecting manholes, I, I you know really that's not going to happen. If there's a problem, let me know. I'll inspect manholes if you want me to when I'm sitting on city council, and all you have to do, Ray, right, basically is take a picture of the issue. Um, my email, my direct personal email is on my website, votelorainemorgeson.com, and I would uh, you know, urge you all for whatever issues you're speaking of, the paving will get the roads, manhole covers, so, you know, start sending me pictures, start sending me locations, and absolutely you don't have to wait for staff to hear about it. That's what a city council representative is supposed to do, is to be your link to staff. So um, again, my email address is on my website. Please feel free to use it now because whether or not I sit on council, I care about my city and I'll help as best I can right now. And you can also email or, or call the mayor's action line too because there's a uh, report made on every call and then it has to be followed up. Uh, I'll save that for Do you have that phone number? Do you have a mayor action phone number? 893-7111. 893-7111. Thank you. With the amount of land on both sides of the San Martin... Oh, shoot. Uh, uh, with the amount of land on both sides of the San Martin Bridge, According to, ADA, according to ADA standards, we could have a substantially taller bridge at that location. What is your position on rebuilding that bridge as high as possible? Who's first? Uh, Lorraine, uh, Lorraine, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the, the bridge situation is hard right now. It's a complete danger zone. I'm on that bridge many times. 
do a lot of bird surveys on Gandhi Beach and so forth. And um, uh, in terms of how high it has to be, how wide it, it definitely has to be wider. Um, I have no problem whatsoever. Remember that every time a bridge goes higher, it's a lot more expensive. So, and is this is the county that's building the bridge, isn't it? It's not city money, is it? It's a county. It's a county. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of hard for, um, you know, when, when it's not coming from the city coffers to have a lot of say. Although, I can say that since I know I've been working with the county for 15 years and run a couple of volunteer organizations for them, um, there's no reason that I couldn't go and talk to them and find out what we can do there. I totally agree with you that the, the present bridge situation is even far and above boats and water quality is a complete danger to humans. Bicycle traffic and, and, and vehicular traffic. So something needs to be done. It's a long way away, but let's start working on it and figure out what we can do. And actually, as a member of the Metropolitan Planning Organization, I've been able to move the San Martin Bridge um, design and construction up. When I initially was on the MPO, they were talking about 2020, uh, 2021 for that to be uh, completed. So, by being on the MPO, we have moved that up. Um, by getting a Tiger grant, we will move that up even more. And really, from a point of view of what you're looking for from a city council representative is somebody who understands how that can happen and to have the ability to, to bring um, federal money into the district, like I've done with Gandhi and like we're trying to do with uh, San Martin. So that's the way you solve the problems. You figure out where the funding sources are, you figure out how you can piece it together, and then you then you go after it from, from that regard. Thank you. Um, where's the bridge design plan? Did you have, where's the plan on, online? What is the design of the bridge that you got funding for? The funding for design is in, I believe, 15. So oh, so it's not designed up. yet. No, because this question was about design. But you have to fund design before you can have it designed. Okay. Um, Roy O'Neill has done a lot of research on this bridge and everything. He wanted to say something. Oh, my turn. Okay. Here's the deal. Uh, it doesn't do any good to complain to the city or the county or the county about what kind of bridge you want, because people who are designing that bridge, they've already designed it. They already have made up their mind what they're going to do. And no matter what you do, they're going to build the kind of bridge they want to build. So there is one person you can talk to where you can get something done. There is a little office called the Coast Guard Navigation Office. And the county has to go to this Coast Guard Navigation Office in order to get permission to build the kind of bridge, excuse me, to build the kind of bridge they want to build. Now, the, uh, the county has probably already done this. They've already made up their mind. So most of what you want to do, or you're trying to do by writing to people, it's not going to make any difference. But what you're going to do is you have to contact this Coast Guard uh, Navigation Office, and you've got to find out what the county has already told them because the county has probably told them that there are no boats here. There's a few residents, you know. We've only got 400, I think, uh, waterfront lots behind that bridge. And so God knows what the county has told the Coast Guard. So if you don't go to the Coast Guard and find out what they've got on their records, you're done for. You're doomed. You're going to get what the county wants to give you. Now, I, uh, I try to get this information out of Mr. Hornick. You know Mr. Hornick? Tony? Tony Hornick? I believe so, yeah. He's the chief engineer for Bridges. And he has stonewalled me religiously. He won't give me, the, he won't give me a copy of the, comp, uh, of the correspondence he has sent to the Coast Guard. So the only thing you've got to do is you've got to contact these people you're probably going to have to do uh, uh, information, what is it, freedom of information thing. Sunshine. Find out what, what kind of letters they've got in their, in their, uh, you know, in their file for that bridge. And you're probably going to find something pretty astounding in there after you see what the county told them. So uh, I suggested to uh, Joy, what's her name, Eve? Eve Joy. I suggested to Eve that she do it because 
She's not only a lawyer, but she worked for the government, so she knows how they work. But she blew me away and said, oh, no, it doesn't make any difference. But it does make a difference. Now, if anybody in this room wants to take on that job, then uh, I'll send them all the information I've got. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, try to get some of that information in, into the next newsletter. But if you don't contact um, this group, you're done for. Huh? They're going to do exactly what they want. There's Tony Harding is going to do exactly what he wants to. And if you don't believe this place exists, then talk to, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Garcia, the guy who preceded him. Rudy Garcia. Do you ever meet Rudy? No. you know Rudy? Anyhow, he's retired now. But if you don't believe this place exists, talk to him. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Well, okay. I know um, I know the regulator for the county who does the coastal navigation permitting regulation. In fact, I'm very involved with her because of the um, lens issue. So I'll leave her a call. I mean, she worked with the Coast Guard. I mean, that, that's easy. And any records that, that any transference between government, if anyone's telling you that they can't get you public records, they are not obeying the law. So I'll be glad to help filter in on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, where were we? Uh, where was it? Rain? Next. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, red light cameras, where do you stand? They're going. As soon as I get on council, we should have the votes by the time this switches around 2014. It is completely a responsible program, and, when I, and I've been in two different very lengthy meetings regarding the red light camera issue, and when I heard that the city was fully cognizant of the fact that for nine months, eight or nine months, I believe it was, eight cameras were misfiring, the yellow light period was too short as opposed to what the rest of the city's um, you know, time spans were, and that the city refused to refund money to the hundreds of people who got ticketed, in my view, illegally. There is no way this program can work, and it must go away because it's never going to work. You can never make sure that technology is working across the board all the time correctly, and if you're not going to give refunds when it's wrong, the program needs to go. Red light cameras were my new business item. I support them, and I believe that they have if you look at the real statistics, they've done their jobs. They've reduced the T-bone type of accidents, which are the most dangerous type of accidents. The other important factor is when you look at the statistics as to the people that have gotten red light cameras, people only get one. They don't repeat it. And kind of like some of the things we have with the peer we have a lot of false information being given out about red light cameras. We have some citizens that have decided that they are going to study it and be an expert. And then they come in and they contradict what our staff, who has training and degrees in traffic control, say. And when it comes down to that, I'm going to basically believe the staff and not believe people that are kind of creating an issue. I think red light cameras are very, very useful. Okay, the, the uh, uh, I, I have two here. The lens, where do you stand? And then tell us about the lens. Isn't Foster a promoter of it? Uh, let's start with Jim. I have four the lens. I intend to vote no, and hopefully we will build a pier. We have done a terrific process. We used the, the process that is accepted and designed by the Architect Society. And when we look at, once again, the amount of false information given out by the Stop the Lens people, the build, the, the keep the pier, there, for example, we had a wind study. And we finally we got the wind study from the pier, and it basically shows that it's a, it's a well-designed building. But if you look at the little diagrams that the Stop the Lens people put together, they show wind coming through here, and then they have a little stick person falling off over here. It's just a lot of inaccurate information, and I would urge you to vote no and build a pier. Uh, as the office manager for the Stop the Lens office, vote yes to Stop the Lens. It will, the, the poll numbers are way in our favor. I've been on the street for eight months. Collect, I collected probably 7,000 of the petitions myself personally. And uh, this is one of the examples of our city government not paying attention 
to the majority of the citizens and their wishes. Vote yes to slap the lens. Expect to see it go down in flames August 27th. Uh, would anybody else like to ask any questions that haven't, hasn't, haven't, hasn't been asked yet? No? Can I, can I ask, can I bring back up the EMS issue that our officer was talking about? Yeah. And, and, and it's an important issue. Um, because initially, the county figured we had excess response time because our people would get there in under four minutes and 30 seconds. And the county standard was seven minutes and 30 seconds. Um, we wound up basically, we have this 1989 court order that is very strong and very persuasive and basically requires the county to fund us in the same for the same standards that existed at that time. And we have been able to enforce that court order. Two years ago, when this issue came up, I was chair, of, three years ago maybe, I was chair of city council, chair of EMS. The city staff, the county staff got together, they put together binders of what they agreed upon, what they disagreed upon. We wound up having a meeting with not only the county commission, the city council, but the state legislature. I'm not going to be able to do this in 15 seconds. I don't know if we have the time no, limits. No, no. Okay. But it's, but it's a really vital issue. The Fitch study that, that was spoken about, it was about an 80 to 90 percent victory from the point of view of the city because it, it, it stopped priority dispatch three from going into effect. And that would be a situation where EMS, our EMS guys wouldn't be notified and Sunstar folks would just come into the city and take care of our residents. And that's the line that we've drawn in the sand, where we're not going to allow Sunstar, which has approximately a 25% turnover of their employees per year, to come into our city and take care of our residents without our guys knowing it. Our red trucks show up, they need to stabilize, they need to treat. We probably would prefer to transport, because that's where the money is, but the county has control of that, and they can they're going, to, they're going to keep that. But the one thing that we can make sure is that our people in the, the, the blue shirts and the red trucks will be there in time to treat you. And we can make sure that the county funds it the way they need to. And we've been able to do that in the past years. If you want to talk about that issue in more detail when we're done, let me know. I have a question. Oh, okay. Is this the vote on lens will be before your election? Uh, it really doesn't matter what your opinion is. So this is for both of you. If the you, if you have opposing views, if the if if the vote goes against your side, how do you plan to move ahead? You know, with the, the people voting against. Do I go view? first since he just had time that I didn't have? Um, yes. Uh, either way, what. Uh, should be happening, regardless of how it goes, is that we have a waterfront master plan visioning process going on. Hopefully you're all aware of that and you've been informed of that. That process goes through July of 2015. And what that process is doing is looking at the entire waterfront. Remember that the TIF funding, the $50 million, is not money in the bank. That's money that we would be borrowing, you know, taking out bonds to borrow against future tax revenue. So it would make utterly completely better sense to look at the entire waterfront's needs, which suppose we have to do some seawall work to go in the Benoit Basin, or suppose we have to do this, that, or the other thing. Look at what the entire assessment is of the waterfront because we voted on a referendum to have a waterfront master plan. And in the meantime, open up the pier back up. The air conditioning is going right now because they can't shut it off because it'll get moldy. Open the pier back up because whatever we do next, whether it's building the lens or building something else or refurbing the pier, it's going to be a long time before something happens. So what I would propose is that we open back, back, open the pier back up in a limited fashion because the air conditioning has to stay on. Ground floor, maybe a farmer's market kind of mode. People could still go out there. We could still use the elevator and go to the top and at least enjoy the space until a decision is made this time with the complete hopeful buy-in and participation of the city and look at the holistically situation in the entire waterfront. It's only one pot of $50 million of borrowed money. We shouldn't plunk it all down on any one thing until we've assessed the entire waterfront. That's what I would be 
you know, proposing. That doesn't answer my question. Okay, well, so well, the question was... The question was, for you would have been if they vote for the lens, then what would you, how would you... If, they, oh, if the citizens that vote for the lens, we're building the lens. Your, if it went against your feelings, oh, then well, Jim, if it went against his feelings. If the citizens vote to build the lens, we're building the lens. I mean, that's what a vote is about. So, I mean, it wouldn't be my choice or it, that's what we're voting on uh, August 27th. So if you're asking if, if, the, if the vote goes against my position, I'll have to fully support what the citizens decide. That's what democracy is about. And if the vote goes against the lens, my biggest concern is that we're going to repeat history where we had five or six years before the inverted pyramid, where we had nothing there and we had stagnation downtown. You've got to keep progress moving. We couldn't go out for another bid and get worldwide architects to give us designs because, hey, we did that once and we threw it away, so who's going to bid there? My opponent says the, the pier is a bit able to be reopened. Once again, it's a disregard of science. The guys that built that approach and the outside in the 1920s, they did a really good job. But the salt water, the environment, that, that just, we don't, we can't put garbage trucks on that thing. So it has to go. And when, when I was criticized from the point of view of not letting people vote on the pier, my response was, if a majority of people vote that the pier is structurally sound, will it become so? I don't think that's something you vote on. I think that's something you accept science and you accept that this, these beams that have been in the water since the 1920s can't hold support. And they, they served us well, but they've got to go. And if we don't get the lens built, my concern is we won't have anything there for more than five years. And that's not going to be good for our city. Anybody else? I have a question. Uh, if the pier is in such bad shape, why not just get the pier in good shape and not try to put something fancy and very expensive on top of a pier that's in bad shape and has to be completely renovated before you put the thing on the end of it? That's it, would, it would cost us. They separate it? it would cost us more money to renovate the pier, and we would continue to spend a million and a half to two million dollars or more from our general revenue supplementing it. I look at the lens as an extension of our park system. We pay about two million dollars a year to maintain our park system. They're estimating that the um, subsidy for the lens will be in the six seven hundred thousand dollar figure. To me, I equate that as to the same upkeep that we have to give to our parks and extension of that. Economically, it doesn't make sense to try to refurbish the pier, the, the approach, the, the inverted pyramid. They have had their useful life, and to refurbish them, to spend more money than we have for the 50 million, to continue to have a subsidy, that doesn't make economic sense. How can you can, get I, can I give an answer now too? Because I just said one question. Yeah. How can you get to the lens if you can't drive out on the pier because it's so bad? Wouldn't you well, have to get no, the pier first? Th that's part of the approach. That that you'll be able you you won't be driving your own car. You'll be able to walk, bike, get on a tram. But that new approach that that's part of the lens. The old one's going to be taken down. Lorraine, would you like to? Yes, I absolutely. The reason that the city came up with a $70 million, $83 million refurbishment amount is they widened the pier by 50 feet in their one and only refurbishment plan. There were three or four different engineering plans when this whole thing began that the city would not even take in and look at that were below $50 million to refurbish the approach, which is what needs to be done. It needs to be heightened because FEMA codes have changed, as you well know. Again, we're talking about sea level rise and, 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 and climate change issues to come. The county is already paying attention to this. Our city is not. So, you know, essentially what, what needs to be done is that the peer approach would be, you know, strengthened, resupported, raised up four feet, 
the ground level, what is now the current first floor of the pier, would be basically like a breakaway wall scenario. In other words, it would be open air, almost like kind of the bottom of the million dollar pier, right? And then, so the, the approach would have to go up and you would enter on the second floor, and that's where you would go. And there were several plans that were under $50 million, but our city really, you know, really who it is is Mayor Mike Connors. He's the one who wants to make that pier go away. Mike Connors is the guy who does, he used to do the storm water and now is basically, you know, our, our, but, you know, he is the one who really wants that pier taken down because he just doesn't want to take care of it. It can be fixed, it can be refurbished, and it can be done for under $50 million. There are companies out there right now who could do it. But there is some agenda to get rid of the land, uh, get rid of the pier for some reason, and it's not necessary. Reuse, renew, recycle. <coughs> That's supposed to be the code words of our city for St. Petersburg, and we can refurbish. I'm not saying that we have to refurbish the pier, but understand that they came up with that $70 million figure because in the one plan they looked at, they widened the approach by 50 feet, 50 feet of concrete all the way from the land out to the pier. That's why they come up with that number. That is not the number if you made the approach and, and, you know, shrunk it to 40 feet. That's very possible. We don't have to drive out to the pier. We could have a tram or some kind of scenario like that, you know, a green kind of tram scenario. If you shrunk it, right now it's 100, okay, it's 100 foot wide. They lengthened it to 150 feet wide. If we shrunk it to 40 feet, it would be way cheaper than any numbers they're coming up with right now. And there are actually other city council people who are on the dais right now who are looking at that. So that is not true that it has to be taken down. It is not true. That doesn't mean we have to refurbish it, but it is not true that the only way to deal with this is to destroy and rebuild new. Okay, uh, let's go back to the time. Okay. Uh, Hang on, I'm not ready. The, the, how do, how do uh, what's your opinion about citywide curbside recycling? Jim. I support it. Um, I think we need something that we need to figure out how to do. Um, there are, right now the way we have it set up requires citizens to either pay or take it to one of our waste facilities if you want to recycle. If we do it citywide, um, that will be, the cost will be added into the sanitation expense. Um, some of the polls we've seen on that are some people like it, some people don't. Um, we, I, I'm kind of surprised that we didn't have enough, we only had, I want to say it was like less than 10% of our citizens sign up for the um, voluntary uh, recycling. Um, so it's something that we need to do. The other thing we need to keep in track when we're talking about recycling is the county is the one that runs the waste management. When I got on council, the county was about to pay for us to have recycling, and then they pulled the money back. So we're still going back and forth in that regard. Okay, the League of Women Voters has already done a study. The only way it will work of it is if it's universal curbside recycling. That's the only way that'll eventually be cost effective. The League of Women Voters has already done the research. There are already more forward-thinking council people who are working closely, and I will do that as well to make sure we find out the other programs in other parts of the nation that made that work and actually made money off it. And it, and it will include some upfront front expenditure, but in the end, it will end up being making the city money if it's done correctly, as well as really cleaning up you know, the whole <laughs> waste scenario that we need to do. So I absolutely support it, but only universal. There is no way you know, a partial I buy in, you buy in kind of scenario is ever gonna work for this city or any city. It just doesn't happen. Okay, um, Kathy, you want to give me two minutes for okay. closing? Uh, Lorraine, you want to go first? Um, I want to say that it was really great to come here tonight. Again, I live really close to you, and as some of you know, I kind of was in District 3 until the redistricting occurred, and two houses in my neighborhood got switched over into District 2. So that's why you kind of haven't heard of me on the scene up here but now I am. And the reason I ran is because it was not in my business plan, although I've been an active volunteer for 20 years. And again, please go to my website. You can see my long history of participating in county issues. I don't know if you're familiar with the environmental charter amendment that we voted on in 2008 that passed by 70% of the vote. 
that was my issue that I carried forward as a volunteer for two years, brought it to fruition. The county actually wrote the ordinance, outwore the referendum, and then we voted on it. Um, I've worked a lot on environmental issues, as some of you may know. Um, I started my civic career doing uh, on 34th Street, as I said earlier, leading the anti-drug marches and anti-hooker marches there for years and years. Um, I participate, participated a lot with folks in the Midtown area doing the Rice anti-drug march process there as well. Um, I know that we have seriously um, lost what we had when we used to have a good community policing um, kind of force. I want to bring that back because I hear it all over the city all the time that, you know, even if it's political policing, we need it back. Neighborhoods do not feel in touch anymore, and it really counts when you have a guy or a guy and a girl who, you know, know the kids on the corner, know what's going on in the neighborhood. And yes, it may be a little more, and we might have to hire a few more police officers. That would always be a good thing for St. Petersburg. But community policing and um, lots of other issues I'm familiar with all over the city. My job is to bring us all together and have votes in legislation that are supported by the majority. I'd like to. And, and thank you for having me. What I'd like to be able to do is continue what I believe I've done the last uh, five years, and you know, represent this district well uh, by bringing amenities to it, such as the playground, the park, um, canal dredging, and such along those lines but also continue to provide the leadership that I have provided citywide, um, from, from being council chair, from being chair of the Budget Finance Committee, the Inve Investment Oversight Committee, the EMS Committee. The, the, the stuff that where the, the rubber really hits the road are things that I've dove into and, and basically help orchestrate. Also from the point of view, um, transportation, as I said once again, is the biggest issue facing us as a county. And um, I am positioned well to help transportation happen uh, from the point of the chair of PPC, MPO, the ACPT, and all that transportation stuff. Um, understand that the green light Pinellas, and I'd ask you to go online and look at that greenlightpinellas.com, 75% of that is bus rapid transit. Um, there is a rail component, but mo mainly it's bus rapid transit. So I'd ask for your support from A, continuing to bring and keep amenities in our district. Uh, B, continue to provide the leadership that I have on city council. And C, continue to provide the leadership that I can provide on the countywide level um, and bring back the $120 million uh, for the Gandhi overpasses and the $22 million for the, uh, for the bridge and, and know how to actually represent folks and, and bring that stuff home. So thank you. I want to thank you both for coming out and uh, making time in your busy schedule for all this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just want to make a couple announcements. Uh, everybody here.